This morning, let me give a disclaimer before uh, we get into it. Anytime we talk about something as deep and broad as prayer or perspective, I feel like I should give a disclaimer. In fact, I probably should give this disclaimer any Sunday I teach about anything when it comes to God, because we are never going to exhaust him. We are never going to know it all. We are never going to understand it all. That is not my objective this morning, especially as it relates to this topic called prayer. I'm not one of those people that you would identify as a prayer warrior. I don't necessarily fit that description. I want you to know that I believe um, when God tells us to pray, and he says it often throughout the scriptures, I believe in this. Um, I, I believe we are forever learning and growing in the amazing love and grace of God to the degree that even in a, a topic as broad as prayer, it's okay to be a student. It's okay to be a little child. I, I hope you hear as a pastor at Grace Life Fellowship, there are no professional prayers. There are no professional prayers. We get the freedom through the gift of prayer, to speak and to listen to God. I believe God can do anything. I mean that. I believe God can do anything he wants. That's part of the disclaimer, by the way. Because we're going to talk about some practicality in prayer, some personal aspects and components of prayer, not just what we have maybe thought of or how we've heard this all of our lives in terms of uh, I, I need to pray more. I've never met anybody, anybody that says they pray enough. Is that you? <laughs> I, I just, I've never met anybody that goes, you know, Tim, in my walk with God, now I could probably do this more and this, but I pray enough. I, that, that part of my life, whew, I got it going on. I've never met anybody that says that. And it makes me ask the question, and, and, and some of what I want to do this morning is just kind of talk out loud, which maybe is a fairly decent definition of a part of prayer. Just talk out loud with you about prayer. Um, if you feel like you don't pray enough, what's God's opinion of that? So, so is God saying, yeah, I agree, y'all don't pray enough? If things don't go your way, is it because you didn't do something? I talk to people, I've felt like this before. Well, what's the point in prayer? Have you ever felt that way? What, what does it matter? God's going to do what? What he wants anyway. I just want you to imagine for a second that I approached my marriage with Catherine in that idea. Why talk with Catherine? She's going to do what she wants anyway. Do you see, when we bring it down to a human practical level, maybe prayer is nothing more, and when I say that, I don't mean to diminish its impact or effect, I, that prayer is this beautiful opportunity of communicating with us and God. Us to God, God to us. Some of it verbal, most of it nonverbal, I believe, uh, what if that's what pr prayer is? After all, the scripture is loaded with its encouragements and its exhortations and commands even to pray. Pray for the sick. Pray for each other. Pray for your enemies. Pray that you don't fall in temp into temptation. It's all over the place. And it says in James 5.16, the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. This is a description, not a formula. This is, this, is a, this is a reality. This is an observation James is giving us. In Jesus Christ, we have become righteous. We are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Our communication with him, our prayers, they're powerful. They're effective. Back to my illustration with Catherine. If I cease to communicate with her under the, the pretense that, well, what does it matter? It's not going to change her. She's going to do what she wants anyway. Then I've limited my communication with somebody that loves me and someone that I love to one simple component of asking and receiving. I think many of us as believers have limited what prayer is 
to the narrow idea that it is only asking and receiving. As if we are so needy that all that we need God for is to change certain things around us or about us. And, and, and we pray for those things, whether it is a healing of a sick person or my bank account or a relationship idea or God give me wisdom to know which car to buy or which job to take or which person to marry or which school to go to. Okay. When, we, when we think of prayer only in the aspect of asking and receiving, we are limiting the idea of communicating with God to simply what we think we need. If I did that in my marriage, and I've tried that, by the way, I've spoken to Catherine in ways where she says, I wasn't asking you for anything. I was just wanting you to listen. i be honest with you. I don't really understand that. <laughs> don't know how that helps much. Because even in my listening sometimes to her communicate with me, I still don't understand there are times when she communicates something to me that she'll say, I'll say, well, I, help me with that. She'll say, I don't know. She can be crying. I'll say, Catherine, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to fix the cry. And she'll go, I, I'm not asking you to fix it. I'm just asking you to listen. Okay, I'm listening. Why are you crying? And she goes, I don't know. <laughs> what if all of this is just part of what God offers us in communicating with him? Maybe before we go any further, we should pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us this gift called prayer. I will confess what's obvious to you. I don't really understand stand it. I don't claim today to be able to understand it in a way to teach it or exhaust it. But Father, just to share openly and honestly that it really is a gift. We have turned the gifts that you give us, the opportunities that you give us into religious obligations in such a way that we think when life doesn't go as we think it should, we're wondering if we've done the right religious obligations. And in so doing, Father, maybe missing the opportunities that you afford us by relationship. I pray this morning that we would simply see what you want us to see in regard to our relationship with you and what that means in communication with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what prayer is and what prayer is not. I actually found it easier as I was looking at this and thinking through this and talking out loud about this with others that it was easier for me to see what prayer is not than it is to see what it actually is at times. But I'll take a stab at it. Prayer is simply communication with God. We've made this, this word prayer be an all-inclusive religious word, and we use it as a noun and a verb. We use it as, things we, as something we do, we pray, that's the verb, or we use it as something that is, we, we say prayers. And all of a sudden, we begin to say, use the word prayer interchangeably, and we say, I'm praying for you, or I will pray to God. I will pr and all of a sudden, prayer takes on a religious definition rather than a, a relational one. So, so I'm, I'm not here for jargon. I'm not here to change how we say things or to be a grace Pharisee about words we use. Please don't hear that. I'm here for the big picture idea. We talk about praying and really what all we're talking about is communicating. All we're talking about is communication with us and God, between us and God. And I said before, it's more than words. But it is no less than recognition of being in a relationship with Him. So, so prayer is, is more than just words that are spoken. It includes that, but it's not limited there. But it's a recognition of being in a relationship with the Creator of the universe. We communicate together. We have fellowship together. And just like any relationship that you are in with a human being, your communication, by the way, we are predisposed to communicate. None of you are here this morning without a phone. And that phone in the old days was simply to pick up and call somebody. Now we actually do it to avoid talking to somebody. We text them, 
right? I don't, I, you've done that. I'm not the only one that does that. I'll text because then I don't have to actually call them. We're using our lines of communication in every way that we can. There used to be a typewriter. Now we have all of it on our phone. We are beings that were made for communication. This is evident in everything that we do. We are communicators. God wired us that way. He designed us that way because God, by and large, is a communicator. God wants to tell us who he is, who we are, what we're about together. The Son of God, Jesus, is the Word of God. He is the living Word that the written Word speaks of. The Word, the written Word, the Bible, the Scripture speaks of the living Word, the person, Jesus. But, but one of his descriptions, he's the Word. He's the Word of God. He's the Word of life. We are made for communication. So anytime we think of prayer with God as the only narrow view of this is the part where I ask God for things that he could give me, we are limiting our communication. If it doesn't work in my marriage, it doesn't work in my relationship with him. We are made for more than that with God. God desires more than that for us. And hence the pressure that we're back to square one. Do, do we do it enough? Or maybe even do we do it right? Prayer is simply communication between us and God. It's, it's you speaking to him, yes. And we're going to look at a, one passage today that talks about we can ask God anything. So while it's not limited to that, it's not limited in that either. God is not threatened by your asking. And I love the passage we're going to look at in Philippians. It says, ask your request. It doesn't, it doesn't put religion on it. It doesn't say, ask it if it's right. It doesn't say, ask it if it's good. It doesn't say, ask it if it's what you're supposed to do. It just says, ask what you want. One of the things, as I look through prayer throughout the scriptures that I love in the Psalms, there is a realness and a rawness to the, praise, to the prayers in Psalms. David specifically, one minute he's praising God for his love and his goodness that will follow him all the days of his life. And the next minute he's asking God to destroy all his enemies in one swoop. He's real in them. He's honest with them. He's not necessarily always right about them. He has a relationship with the father where he can ask anything or say anything because he knows who this God is. So prayer absolutely is us speaking to him, but it's also him speaking to us. God speaks to you. If you ever question that because you hear somebody say, well, God told me. I, anytime somebody says that in my presence, you know what I ask them? Not as a challenge, as a clarification. What does that mean? Because I can tell you for many years when I would hear somebody say, God told me, I would instantly think, Probably as many of you have. There I am missing, it, missing God again. God has never told me anything. I've never heard his voice. I've never heard him audibly speak. H have you? If you I, I started this by saying God can do anything. That's my disclaimer. I'm not saying he can't do that. I'm saying for me he's never done that. I've never audibly heard him speak unless I want to rearrange that idea and say, oh, when Curtis has spoken to me, I've heard God speak. There's no doubt about that. M maybe some of this, that's why I add the, the idea of perspective is how we think about some of this. Absolutely, God speaks to you. Now, I would say it's even more finished than that. The scripture said he has spoken to you. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 says he has spoken to us in these final days in his son. You want to know how God speaks to you? He speaks to you the way he has spoken to you in his son. What has he spoken to us in his son? Well, in him there is no condemnation. There is complete forgiveness. There is righteousness. There is joy. There is fellowship. These are the things that God has spoken to us in Jesus. These are the things he continues to speak to us about in Jesus. 
You have thoughts that cross your mind in a daily way that, that you go, that, I like that thought. It could be something you've done where you've messed up and then all of a sudden a thought comes in, I'm not a mess up. I, I'm forgiven. I'm loved anyway. These are the ways God speaks to us. It's not limited to signs written in the clouds or audible voices. It is broad as his word to us, his spirit in us. And these thoughts that cross our minds that are foreign to anything that sin or the enemy or this world system would invite us to. God speaks to you. I want to I confirm that as somebody who is super practical, who has never heard the audible voice of God, who is claiming I'm not a prayer warrior in the sense that we think of that. But man, as I look at this idea of prayer and what it really is, that it's, it's, it's a gift of our mutual communication with the God of the universe. He has spoken to you and he speaks to you in his son. You don't have to ask that question. Maybe the better question at times is, am I listening? Oh, that's a fair question. Yeah, are we listening? And I don't mean that as a guilt or a shame or a condemnation or, okay, I get it. I don't listen good enough. No, it's, I believe we become better listeners when we trust who's speaking. When we trust the one that is speaking to us, we're more inclined to tune our ear to it. Let him, let him who has ears to hear, let him hear. When we know how good God is, when we know that he communicates with us, when we know that we were wired for this, then we start to see some of those passages that have, that have maybe been used to heap guilt and condemnation and to make us think we're inadequate and that we don't do it well enough and I don't do it enough. And the reason that this is happening in my life is I didn't pray about it enough or I didn't pray about it at all. Well, we start to rearrange those ideas and, and, and see prayer not as a magic formula or religious duty, we see it as the gift that it is. So what, what prayer is not is just asking God for things. It includes that, but that's not all it is. Have you prayed about this? Have you asked God about this? Uh, I, as a parent, I, I hear and, and, and encourage the idea that we pray for our kids' future spouses I'm, I'm pretty certain that my in-laws did that. I think my parents probably did that. They probably prayed more for the spouse because of who they were going to get than you get the idea. But could we ever do that enough? Do you ever feel like you've really finished it? When, when, we, when we think that prayer is just asking God for things, we limit this relationship to that. It's so much more than that. I love this quote by Oswald Chambers. Prayer is not only asking, but an attitude of mind which produces the atmosphere in which asking is perfectly natural. Yeah, that, that captures it better. It's not just the asking. It's this attitude in an atmosphere that, that allows for the asking to be completely natural. Th that's what prayer is. It's this open relationship of communication with God where he's not threatened by whatever we ask. You don't have to Christianize your prayers. He doesn't require that. We can ask anything. Prayer is not telling God what to do. It's, it's not the idea that I, I need to inform God of something so then he'll do it. I need to be very specific and at this time so that God understands so that we don't, we don't miss anything because if I don't tell him exactly what to do at exactly the right time, then he withholds his own goodness back towards us because I didn't do it right. Prayer is not a cause and effect idea. It's it's so much greater than that. We think that the reason something's not happening is because I didn't pray. As though prayer is really the power of my ability to speak to God rather than the power in our relationship together in speaking. 
Some, for some, prayer is just our last shot when all else fails. Well, it's come down to this. <laughs> I've done everything I know to do. I've done everything practical. I've done everything that I can possibly accomplish. Nothing's changed. Let's pray. Corey Ten Boom once asked, is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire? For many of us, that's, that's how we look at it. Even that beautiful quote can heap a, a guilt on us, a lack. No, I use it as not only a spare tire. I mean, I use it as a spare tire on an 18 wheel. I guess the last, last, last resort. Prayer is not a religious duty that robs prayer of its intrinsic power that's found in the relationship. We miss the purpose when we make it a religious duty. We, we talk about prayer in terms of spiritual discipline, that it's a discipline that we do spiritually in order to connect with God. But hear this, you have been connected to God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Prayer is the avenue by which we recognize that connection, not get connected. You are connected. Prayer is not a spiritual discipline. It's a spiritual disposition. It's so different. Right now, whether you have recognized this or not, we are praying. We are in communication with Him. We are in communication with one another. We are doing it in a very different way than the activity we call praying. We, we are doing it differently than stopping and doing some, some activity over here where we will stop and bow our heads and pray together. By the way, I don't believe in prayer with God that we have to necessarily have a certain protocol or, or position. We're free. I'm not opposed to the position in prayer or protocol in prayer. That's your choice. We all have different flavors of what we like and how we talk and how we communicate. What if that flavor difference is allowed in the grace of God in our relationship with Him? What if prayer doesn't have to look the same for everybody, even when we do it corporately? I have family members that pray, and it is King James English, beautiful, beautiful prayer. Sometimes I want to record it and just make a poster of it and, and hang it on a wall. It's like artwork. And then my kids pray. And it's pretty much just to get to the meal. But if they're righteous, it's effective. What, what, if, what if all flavors of prayer are allowed in this relationship with Him? Prayer is not just an activity, it's an attitude. Prayer is not an obligation. I got to pray. I hope the got to or the must or the ought in that, and we're going to look at that more next week, actually, in a passage. But I hope the must and ought and have to is out of a desire, not a duty. It's out of the delight of knowing him and that he cares for us rather than this expected spiritual discipline that if I don't, there's no shot at this happening. Prayer is not an obligation. It's an opportunity to be heard to listen, to grow, to be reminded, to participate, and to trust Him. It's an opportunity. It, we can repent of these ideas that I don't do this enough. Everything that happens, every step you take, everything before you is an opportunity in this communication of relationship with Him. When we talk about protocol, I was taught this, this um, an acronym, it, it's called ACTS, A-C-T-S. M maybe some of you were taught similarly. It's a, it's a, 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 a model, a, a, a template that we can use in prayer. By and large, <clears throat> with the understanding that none of us really know how to do it, so let's help. And the A in Acts stood for adoration. This is the portion of the prayer where we come before God and we adore Him. Cynically, I would say we butter Him up. 
We make sure he knows that he's getting all the glory. He's, he's going to be the one we worship. He's going to be the one that is all powerful. We know that. So we adore him. Then the C is, you know it, what is it? It's confession. This is the part after buttering him up, uh, adoring him, that we, we confess. Now sufficiently that we are safe in his presence, we will tell him things that were done in secret, in the dark, sins, shame, guilt. And I confess to him, and I've got to get a clean slate before God, because if I don't, the, the, the more important component of this prayer, which is at the end, the, it's the S, it's the supplication, it's the asking, it's the petition, it's the request, it's why I really came to him. If I don't confess and get clean and right with him, then he'll never answer that according to my, not his will, <laughs> my will. If I make my request known to him, I want him to answer him according to my request, not his will. The T is for Thanksgiving. This is the part, this is the sandwich of the buttering up, the confession, and now I thank him because this is the presupposed idea that God's going to answer it according to what I want. This is the, I'm I'm being cynical about this, not because I think that it's horrible to share this or have learned this. Again, I'm not trying to be a grace Pharisee on on language or lingo or, or verbiage. It's the idea. It's what it can communicate to the listener. It's what it can throw me into a model rather than a personal relationship. So I I give thanksgiving to God. I'm grateful to him. And then I do my supplication, the S. Supplication simply means request, petition. I, I request of God what it is I really want. And that can be anything. And it can, it can go to any degree. And when I'm done, I wrap this whole idea up with a, a, a phrase. And we're going to see why we say this phrase. And the, there's nothing wrong with the phrase. It's in Scripture. Um, but it's in Scripture not just as a phrase. It's in Scripture as a idea, a reality. A reminder. The phrase is, as you all know, in Jesus' name. So I've prayed this prayer where I've asked God for, I've I've adored him, I've confessed to him, I've thanked him, and then I've asked things of him, and then I wrap it up in Jesus' name. And I do this religiously in the hopes that having done it religiously, correctly, the way I was told, the way I was taught, that God will finally give it to me. You see the absurdity when I just talk it out loud, but it's not absurd that we have experienced this, that we have felt the pressure of this, That we have even felt as humans the need to protect God's reputation and our faith when the things that we have requested don't actually happen, even though we thought we followed all the right method. I did the A, I did the C, I did the T, I did the S, I did the in Jesus' name, and yet so-and-so did not get healed. And yet this still happened. And yet I did not get the promotion. And all of a sudden, I'm left to my own misguided attempts at trying to figure out what went wrong. Where are you, God? Why aren't you there? Why aren't you listening? Why aren't you responding? I hear the people that say, you told them, but you don't even listen to me. Have you ever felt this? Prayer is not a magic formula. It's not a genie in the bottle. It's not a crystal ball. I want to take the hocus pocus out of prayer so that we see it for what it really is. It's this beautiful gift of communicating with God. In in more than words, in no less than recognition of an attitude and an atmosphere of a relationship. So what do we do with the real black and white verses? Like John 14, where it says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. 
There it is. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Have you tried this? In 2012, Catherine got sick. I can promise you I asked him a lot of things in his name. I asked that the next scan would report that it was gone. Have you ever prayed something like that? There's nothing wrong with that prayer. There's nothing wrong with that prayer. I hope you understand. My point is not to point out what's wrong in what we pray. I, I, I want to I rearrange how we think about prayer. There's nothing wrong with praying continually for what you want, what you desire, for somebody's health, for their healing. There was nothing wrong in me praying that the next scan that Catherine took would be clear. But when it wasn't, where's the problem? There's a religious community out there that will say, well, they claim that it would be clear. And so if it wasn't clear, the problem wasn't in what they claimed. The problem was in my faith. Maybe the problem was in my presumption. Maybe this in Jesus name doesn't mean exactly what we think it means. Maybe it's not the magic formula that that unleashes the power and activity of God. Maybe it's actually the recognition in his name of his power and activity in doing all that we actually need, not what we think we need. And in recognizing that, I can actually be settled in whatever the response is. When I say settled, it doesn't mean it wouldn't hurt. It doesn't mean it wouldn't affect me. It means, by and large, that my peace, that my joy, that my contentment has and never will be found in a scan. And, and you, you just fill in the blank for your own circumstances. And we, we, we've all had many of all of these. In Jesus' name is, is according to his will, in the power and in the work of Jesus. And, and, and we start to realize that God never intended for prayer to be an exact science. No, it, it, it's an expression of relationship. It's an expression of this relationship. And maybe, just maybe, I'm, I'm doing that a lot more than I think. You know, the, even the idea, again, not haggling over words, verbiage. But we, we hear things like, oh, I believe in prayer. I, I believe in prayer. That's a lot of pressure. What does that mean? Maybe, maybe it's better to think of it, I believe in praying. But my belief in God is why I pray. God is powerful. It's a relationship. It'd be like me saying with Catherine, I believe in communication. I believe in communicating. I believe in her. I believe that communicating with her brings me into the recognition of the relationship by which love is mutually shared. Not just requests get answered. If you ask me about my prayer with Catherine, my communication with Catherine, and all I talk to you about is, well, I keep asking her to do certain things and she just doesn't do them. That's kind of how we've talked about God. Oh, we don't, we, we can't really admit that, especially, especially if we're, professionals in the ministry because because we're not supposed to be those that don't have the direct line or the connection with God where he answers our prayers I have people that come to me in my family and go well you've got a direct line with God I go why because grace life signs a check for me we are all ministers of the new covenant we are all children of God in Jesus Christ nobody has a director line than you you're in communion and fellowship with God. Maybe then we begin to see some of the things that he's talking about when he says crazy stuff that we're going to look at here in a minute. But I'll give you a taste of it. Pray without ceasing. 
That's crazy. Yesterday, from 11 to 2, I watched LSU football without ceasing. I prayed during it. And up until the fourth quarter, my prayer was being answered. And then all of a sudden, I started to think, wait a minute. And I started going through this axe progression to make sure I'd covered all my bases. <laughs> Whew, and it was his will. <laughs> Pray without ceasing. If that's more of a duty, a responsibility, an obligation than it is a recognition of a relationship, then none of us, none of us are doing it. Not even Jesus had done it then. We have examples in his life where it says he got up early and went to pray, which implies there were, sometimes he was at a wedding. He was turning water into wine. He was doing other things than what we had typically thought of as praying so does God tell us to pray without ceasing but not Jesus and does Jesus not do it or is praying without ceasing much broader than the idea of stopping to talk to God I want to look at Philippians 4 you know this passage he says, be anxious for nothing. By the way, the context here, it started early. I didn't put it up here, but it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, in everything. Notice it doesn't say necessarily for everything, but in everything, no matter what's going on, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. I love that. It's so basic. It's so simple. No matter what you're going through, talk with him. Let him speak to you. Communicate. Some of it's verbal, yes. Your requests are probably going to be verbal. Some of it's nonverbal. Some of your thanksgiving is a recognition of that you have received as, as 1 Peter says, we have been given everything, granted everything we need for life and godliness. Thank you. I love what Steve Pettit says. He says, if you don't have it, you must not need it. Think about that. Because God says, whatever you need, I've given it to you. I've given it to you. Now, certainly there's a spiritual idea here in terms of Forgiveness and love and acceptance and compassion and mercy and all of that. But it's, it's the idea that we don't come to God from a position of lack. We actually, we actually go to God because we don't lack. Because he has done it all. We can be thank, thankful for it. By the way, that word thanksgiving there is the same Greek word that we get the term Eucharist from. When we celebrate communion, the Eucharist, it's the thanksgiving unto God of his life unto us. So he says, make your requests known. What are your requests? Don't edit them. David didn't. Jesus didn't. In the garden, he said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. But remember what he said before that? Lord, Father, if there is another way, I'll take it. You realize that Jesus Christ was sent to earth. The second person of the Trinity was sent to earth on the mission, for the mission of being the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, that he would come, and this was his mission. This was not unknown by Jesus. He knew it. He knew it from eternity past, and he knew it in the real present of his life on earth. And when the disciples who didn't know what he was really after, they thought the Messiah was going to come and set up an earthly kingdom first, and he had to teach them, no, first, it's death. When he shared that with them, they didn't believe it. They couldn't fathom it. They didn't understand it. That's why they're despondent after the crucifixion and the resurrection. They're, they're on the road to Emmaus. They're walking away going, what's going on? Have we wasted our three years? Jesus has to show up and show them 
that he had been telling them this throughout the scriptures. He knew what he was here for. And yet at the moment of human impact, when it was affecting him personally, in reality, in the the vulnerability of his human body, Jesus prays unto God the Father and says, if you... In short, if you've got another way other than the cross, I'll take it. You know what he's being? Real and raw. He's being honest. There's nothing in what he feels that feels like going to the cross. But Hebrews tells us, for the joy set before him, he would endure it. He didn't go based on how he felt. He knew. But he prayed whatever he felt. I love that. You're free to pray whatever you feel. You're free to pray whatever you want. You don't have to edit it. You don't have to make it religious. You don't have to make it right. You don't have to make it fit some parameter that you think is expected by God. Make your request known. I love that. Make your request known. And then he says, with thanksgiving. This this attitude that says, I I recognize something. The same passage that says, to pray without ceasing, you know what it also says? In all things give thanks. It's kind of a parallel passage to this Philippians passage. It's this one. Sorry. It's this one. Rejoice always without ceasing in everything and give thanks for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What's God's will? In everything, give thanks. In everything. Not for everything. In everything. Thank you, Father, that even in Catherine's illness, you let me speak to you freely. Even in this situation that I don't understand, I don't like, that it feels like junk. Even in this, I can ask of you, I can request of you anything. And actually, what's amazing is, it's in the request, notice that he says, and the peace of God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. You know what I really love about this passage? is that if we want to look to a formula, there's not one. Because you would expect it to say, hey, be anxious for nothing. Make your request known to God. Do it with thanksgiving. Seems like an if-then. And God will answer the request according to your desire, and then the peace will come. God's not real good with formulas. Because he's got a missing part in this equation he says communicate with me whatever you want recognize this relationship with me and when you do it will be with thanksgiving the eucharist and you can ask anything and you can talk about anything And when you recognize my everything to your anything, it's not that the prayer gets answered according to how you say it wants to be or what you think it should be or what you desire. Actually, the peace that you're really after, you you realize we're after something deeper than some circumstantial change in our lives. What could you handle if you really had peace? What could you handle if you really had joy? What could you handle if you really had love and acceptance and value? Anything. In Jesus Christ, you really have that. You already have this peace. Romans 5.1 says that we were justified. We have peace with God. It's a possession. Philippians 4 says you want to experience the peace you have with God? Just communicate. He'll remind you. Just, Just relate. Do I want to experience all the the beauty of what my relationship with Catherine offers me? Just participate in the communication. Verbal, nonverbal, just being. When should I do that? At located times and places? Yeah, sometimes we call that date night. But, But when should I stop doing it? Never. Do it without ceasing. Why would you ever quit that? You can't. 
you're in it. You can miss it if you don't participate. But do it without ceasing. Do you start to see that we, we begin to think of this praying with God, praying to God, differently than located religious active moments? It's the relationship. And what happens? The peace that we have begins to get experienced. The peace of God. Well, what do you mean? Why does it say, and it surpasses all comprehension? Well, because my request didn't necessarily get answered the way I want. You, you've seen the car I drive. God hadn't answered that prayer. Well, then how is there peace? Because, because I already had the peace. It's in Him. Well, then how am I experiencing that peace? Because I'm in a relationship and we're talking about it. And my peace doesn't come from the vehicle I drive. It comes from Him. And that's what will guard your heart and mind. We start recognizing that if only prayer we ever said was thank you, it'd probably be enough. It'd be enough. And I'll close with this quote from Martin Luther because I think it sums up so well everything we've been talking about. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. It's who you are. It's who he is. Prayer is a description of the relationship that we have with him. You no longer have to be under the fettered weight of the burden and obligation and duty of praying. You are freed to the expectant relationship that we are in communication with him and he with us. Father, we thank you for the truth that sets us free. We thank you for the reality that you have wired us for communication. And then you have met that wiring in your communication to us. Father, thank you that you speak. Thank you that you have spoken. Thank you whether we hear it audibly, whether we see it tangibly. We know you communicate with us. And Father, for all the pressure that we have ever felt that we don't communicate enough back to you, I thank you for the reality of the relationship that we are in it with you. You have determined it so. You have set it on its course. And we're never going to escape it and neither do we want to. We are in relationship with you and it is without ceasing. And so for any time and all times, we recognize and we thank you in all things, that we are in communication, communion, relationship, unceasing prayer with you. May this be our mindset to set us free to the loving relationship we actually have. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Have a great week. We'll finish this next week as we look at the other side of this. Go have a great week. <laughs>